And now we have the plenary presentation from last year's Jill Landsberg Award winner, Ellen Ryan Colton. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ellen Ryan Colton. I'm from Charles Darwin University, and I'm very pleased and grateful um, to be here for the Jill Landsberg Scholarship Talk for 2018. I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, that this is a real collaborative project with the Pinjarra and Yunkinjarra people from the APY lands, which is very far away from here in northwest South Australia, uh, without whom this project wouldn't be possible, but actually who this project is for. So I'd like to give a big shout out to them. Of course, the APY organisation are a big partner in this, as are the other partners that you see on the screen. Uh, I'm in the second year of my PhD, and I'd like to um, show some of the results so far about what we're discovering um, as buffalo grass, which is an invasive grass. It's actually declared as a weed in South Australia, luckily and what it's doing to country in that part of the world. To set the context for this work, I'd like you to meet one of these traditional owners, Emily Paddy. So uh, she actually was a teacher out on one of the remote homelands where I ended up doing a lot of the uh, field work. So she was teaching kids on country 20 years ago and what they've said to me and a lot of her peers have said to me is that there are just so many bush foods around uh, lots of bush tucker, but things that I hadn't heard of before, such as the aesthetic value of the land, just lots of pretty flowers around, making them feel good. And there were lots of good tasks to do, such as patch burning and tracking animals. So in this talk, let's just first of all, and, and at the forefront, think about Emily sitting there in a wall-to-wall -wall kind of landscape of, of buffalo grass, which to her and to us is a very unfamiliar grass. It can't be burnt in the traditional ways. As we'll see later in the talk, it kind of stops plants growing around it in, in a particular way that I'll have to figure out. And it's country that actually people don't want to walk through and especially don't want their kids to walk through. Uh, you can't see tracks, you can't see snakes, and you sometimes can't find a place to sit down and have a picnic. So this is the context for the work and I'll try and describe some of the changes that we're seeing. The story begins 25 years ago um, when buffalo grass was only just planted around communities on a few roadsides and was not found out on country. At this time, we actually have an excellent baseline ecological and traditional knowledge data set before buffalo grass invades. So South Australian government scientists for the whole of that decade were carrying out important survey work with Ununul. And they only found buffalo in about 3% of their 250 sites. So let's hold that figure in our mind. This is actually a unique opportunity to go back to some of these sites repeat the methodology as best as possible and try and detect any impacts of buffalo on a suite of taxa. And they measured plants, small mammals and reptiles, birds and invertebrates. It's also a unique opportunity to get some of the original scientists involved. So here we can see Peter Copley, Peter Lang and others talking with Ginger Wickleary and Lynn Baker there, talking about plants in 1996. Here's Pete, um, stylish in the 1990s, standing in head-high panicum grass. And who would think that him and four other of the original scientists would still be around and willing to be involved in this project? So that's a big part of the scholarship funding went to getting them on board. So I'm collaborating with the original scientists, but I'm also deeply collaborating with Ununul. And We've heard some great talks this week already about organisations working together. Or for those people that are interested in this type of work, I thought I'd put some figures down for how long it takes um, to really develop relationships and do essential consultation. So I've done big surveys in 2018 and then in a different area of APY in 2019. So you've got two areas with quite different family groups that require separate consultation. I started flagging this project with people two years prior to any surveys being conducted. 
with up to five um, pre-survey trips, often camping out with people, totalling about 16 days for each um, region, which people have to be properly paid for, and so they should be. So that's something to factor into any project like this. Always having a formal meeting with lots of communicative materials to break down that language barrier. There ended up being 41 participants in the first survey and a school group, so it was pretty mega. But this is something I don't know really wanted. And it came up in the consultations to have that school group out there for kids to be um, learning on country alongside of us. So of course, you know, we were going to do that. And I'd just like to highlight um, over here on the on the side, that the consultation process also involves feedback after you do the work, so you don't just walk away. So we've done photo storybooks, additional photos have been sent to everyone, newsletters posted up in community, uh, presentation at ranger meetings, and I'm cont in continued phone contact with these guys. So that's just some of the raw examples of, of how this stuff works in practice. So we've done a lot of planning consultation. How do we set up the survey design to detect some of the impacts of buffalo grass? Well, we've got a before, after, and a um, control and impact scenario. So a perfect backy design, right? Well, not entirely. It's 23 years between the before and after situation. So here we have some sites have become fully invaded by buffalo, while others remain buffalo free. Yet given that long temporal um, time frame, we wanted to strengthen the design, so we actually added in some additional spatial sites that were in the same landscape position, soil type, vegetation type, but one is invaded and one's not. Here we've got a hill site of the same, it's not invaded, and we've matched it up with a hill site that is invaded. So that just strengthens the design a bit. Also, we've got two um, regions separated by about 300 k's to um, make sure our results are applicable to a broader area. And we've got 25 sites in total in this setup. So here's some of the results so far. We've been back to 15 of the original vegetation sites. And this is some really important information already coming through. In the 1990s, three of these sites had a little trace of buffalo, one or two plants. But now, every site you go to, bar one, has buffalo present. Even if it's in a native state, it's still got buffalo sitting there in small tussocks ready to invade. So you're up to 93% of sites with buffalo. I'm wondering if we could expand this um, to the APY lands, and obviously I'd need to go back to more sites, but potentially 93% of the APY lands have some buffalo on there. That would be a scary thought. Again, another important um, situation is when things become fully invaded. None of these sites were fully invaded in the 1990s, and now, as you look at the change, things are becoming fully invaded at least a quarter of the sites. So in the first, I'll just go back. We've got a beautiful native grassland here with lots of forbs and herbs sitting at the, at the base of a hill on the flats. And in the last 20 years, that has become invaded by buffalo. Uh, it looks quite small still, so potentially there was a fire that's gone through. All it needs is a bit of rainfall in the good high rainfall years to really green up and seed. And then this is what we returned to last year. Uh, thick, um, that's a big fuel load sitting there, nothing much growing in between. I'd like to highlight something that Catherine Nano's talk highlighted this morning. And it's, by the way, it's great to see a thread of buffalo grass talks at this conference. But this landscape change is also happening in different habitat types. Here we've got the lower slopes of some hills with spinifex, rigodia up the back, mallee. And look at the time here. This is the year 2000. And in nine years, which is not long for an arid system, buffalo has definitely come in you know, more than co-dominant there. 
A big shout out to Desert Wildlife Services, who as a side project took some of these photos in 2019. It's a great to have that as, as part of the time series. The rangers have been following up that work. In 2015, it's totally dominated. And this is what we returned to last year. Throughout the surveys, Ununur have been highlighting to us, they're really concerned, particularly about trees and shrubs. As you can see, buffalo is sitting right under that canopy, whereas normally native grasses don't do that. Here is the desert fig. It's actually, it's not a past bush food. It's still a really staple food for everyone. Um, they love going out and hunting these. That buffalo's just sitting right under there waiting to burn. So can we use this data set to look at some of the change from 1995 to 2018? I'm just starting to do this, but this is one example. So this graph shows, if we look in the orange, that's tr the percentage of trees and shrubs at sites that have changed from native to invaded states, whereas the blue are sites that have remained native. So if we just look here, in the native sites, trees and shrubs, sometimes they've increased in height by two height classes or one, or sometimes they've decreased in height up to uh, in two classes. So it's pretty much an even spread across there. But for invaded sites, trees and shrubs are more, have more likely decreased in height. So it's now up to me to go back and see maybe what's driving that, have there been fires through. It's not all bad news. Another thing that's really important to Ananul is um, seeing uh, small animals up close, particularly showing the kids this information. And we were really pleased to see that the mammal community was throughout heavily invaded buffalo sites, spinifex sites, and tussock grasslands. There seemed to be no difference in abundance. There was 140 captures, so there was plenty of mammals. And we had spinifex specialists like Ningawi living in really dense buffalo tussocks, so that wasn't known before. Um, so this, this was valuable to Ananul to see, okay, we're looking at dense buffalo, it's not a wasteland, there's still um, small animals out there that we can teach our kids about. They're always talking to us about the loss of bush foods and pretty flowers, and that will come through in some of the floristic data. Catherine Nano's talk um, showed that as well this morning. But here's just a visual indication of maybe how that's occurring. So we can see here down in the bottom, individual buff buffalo tussocks coming in to a native grassland site. And if we look from 40 metres up, it's a clear halo around each of those buffalo tussocks, taking up water or nutrients or both, I'm not sure. But then as that transitions to a fully invaded state, that's what we're looking at. There's no other ground flora to be seen. And on a landscape scale, this is a, a, as a huge change. Some of the other work I'm focusing on is centered on this grassland system. Here we've got a native grassland of the Aerogrossus eripoda um, dominated system where Ananul used to use this as their favorite damper making grass seed. And then a similar same vegetation type habitat that's been fully invaded. So another part of my PhD is looking at the impacts of invasion on seed production of um, ants that eat seeds, and Ununul actually have 18 language names for ants, so they're pretty important. And what I've found is there are far fewer ants that eat seeds, granivorous ants, in these buffalo systems. One of the sites stands out, but actually all of those nests, the ant nests, were centered on that um, little patch of native grasses amongst a sea of buffalo. So why is this important? Well, first of all, I don't all want this information. They've come to us with this issue, and I'm trying to provide that information for them to make decisions. Buffalo grass will expand. It's predicted to expand across much of semi-arid and arid Australia. It's a global issue. There's some um, threatened cactus in Arizona being threatened by buffalo fires, just as the fires around Uluru threatened um, the bloodwoods there. So. 
Um, I think this work is important for Anunul people, but also for all of us to tackle this big issue. Thank you. We do have a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah, don't run away. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can't really see anybody. Is it Carla? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, why is Russell thought to have that impact? What is the role of biodiversity? There's two scenarios. Either buffalo grass comes into a landscape, it's more flammable, it um, sits right under the canopy of trees, so then it could create a more frequent fire or more intense fire system. Or what I think is happening on the APY lands is that fire comes through, opens up the landscape for nearby buffalo seed that's wind dispersed, and it comes in and gets a hold before the natives can come back, and then that starts the cycle. So it would be good. There's actually really good fire mapping data for APY that starts around 94, 95, the same time as these biological surveys. So if I can go back to some of these photo points, overlay that with some fires, then I might be able to get um, more closer to, to what's happening there. Squeeze another question in. Are there, are there management strategies that you think need to be thanks that need to be implemented at you know at that point straight after fire? So there's two um, aspects to buffalo invasion, particularly on the APY lands, that need to be addressed. This is at a landscape scale. It is beyond um, effective herbicide control, so sure certain sites at cultural sites or rock holes can be dealt with by herbicides, but at this scale, it, yeah, we realistic, it can't be. So we need two tools in the toolbox. We need something to reduce the fuel load to get that um, thatch down to stop the big wildfires, and that would protect these woodland species that are so important to Ananul and, and other people. We need actually something to stop it seeding because the seed is wind dispersed and it's just traveling all over the landscape. So if anyone's in the biocontrol um, scene, something to get the thatch down, something to stop it seeding and just hold it in position is what we need to be working on, I think. And it's unfair to expect Arnold Rangers to go out there with backpacks of herbicide and, and tackle this on their own. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, back in the uh, 80s, it was listed, and it wasn't listed, it was um, recommended by the Agricultural Department or equivalents. Is it still listed as a good pasture species in uh, South Australia and Northern Territory? It's not in South Australia. It's declared weed in South Australia, and that was to the good work of the state um, buffalo grass strategic task force, it took a lot of years to get it listed. It's not listed as a weed in any other state. Um, it's traditionally been planted in a little bit higher rainfall to the north of, of Australia, so Queensland and TWA. Um, and there's many different cultivars and actually it's not doesn't perform so well in South Australian more variable wintry rainfall conditions. So that was the lucky part of why it got listed because there wasn't as strong an, a, um, a scene in the partial industry in the South Australia for buffalo. But that is a definite um, a roadblock in other states, yes. And interestingly, in Northern Territory, um, the traditional owners around Uluru and a lot of supporters would even think about splitting the state into two, declaring a weed in the south and not possible in the north. So it could be a regional approach like that. Okay, you might have to wrap it up. Thanks again. That's okay. Really